In a previous video we've had a look at resistivity, we've defined what it is and had a look at an equation which linked it with resistance. Um, but just as in Ohm's law, when we defined Ohm's law we said that that was at a constant temperature, the equation for resistivity holds only at a constant temperature, because at different temperatures the resistivity of a given material is going to change. And so here we're going to be looking at what effect temperature has on materials, on different types of materials, and how we can approximate those when we're looking at relatively small temperature changes. So when we change the temperature of materials, we tend to see two dominant effects. Um, and what we tend to find is that either one or the other is dominant. The first effect, which is dominant in metals, is that as we heat up the material, uh, so as temperature increases, these little atoms inside the metallic lattice start to vibrate a little bit more. So when we increase the temperature, we're increasing the kinetic energy of each of these and they start to vibrate a bit more. So these ones at some temperature might have been just vibrating like this. So vibrating across a relatively small region at moderately slow speeds. Um, and what we might find is that when we increase uh, the temperature to something higher, we tend to get much larger vibrations. So whereas uh, these atoms at a colder temperature, they might have danced around. If you recall the sort of random movement that uh, the electrons go under when they're traveling through the metal, these atoms do something fairly similar, but they tend to be quite fixed to a point, but they will oscillate about that point. Whereas at some higher temperature, we get still oscillating and relatively bound to some point, but both much faster and a larger amplitude. So if we imagine that we're some electron, um, and we're trying to get through this metal in our little random warp drifting in some direction with the current, then if we're trying to pass through a bunch of atoms moving quite slowly, and vibrating over quite a small area, it's going to be easy to fit through the middle. As the temperature increases and these vibrations become much more violent, it becomes a lot harder for this electron to pass through the material. So it's going to have many, many more collisions with the atoms that make up the metal's lattice as it's trying to drift through the metal. So it's going to uh, encounter a lot more atoms and be bounced backwards a lot more as it's trying to drift forwards. Um, and so if we have a look back to drift velocity, we recall that I is N A B E, where E is the charge on the charge carrier, in this case an electron, N is the number density of the charge carriers, A is the cross-sectional cross area of the sample, and V is the drift velocity. Um, so when it's nice and cold, this drift velocity can be quite large. Imagine trying to walk across a crowded room, um, but everybody's standing still and talking to each other rather than hustling and bustling. Whereas as we increase the temperature, they've turned on the rock music and we're now trying to pass through a mosh pit. So as we increase the temperature, it becomes much harder to try and cross through the metal or try and cross through a crowded room. Um, so we can look at the temperature effects on each of these and what effect that has on the current. So the charge on the charge carrier, as we said, is constant. Uh, as we increase temperatures, we have a small amount of thermal expansion. And so technically, the cross-sectional area will get a little bit larger. But it's going to be quite negligible to the two effects. What's happening here in this metal, because of these increased vibrations, this drift velocity is going to go down. And that means that this current is going to go down. And we recall from Ohm's law that current is equal to voltage divided by resistance. So, it, or we can rearrange that for resistance if we want. Uh, so, resistance is voltage divided by current. So, current and resistance are inversely proportional to each other. So, because uh, by reducing the drift velocity, we've reduced the current, that means we've increased the resistance. Uh, as we change the temperature, the number density of charge carriers also changes, and we'll look at that one in a moment. But in metals, this increase in the kinetic energy of the uh, mm, atoms in the metallic lattice, uh, therefore reducing the drift velocity and increasing the resistance, is the dominant effect. 
Uh, if we wanted to link this to resistivity, then we can have a look at the equation which linked resistance with resistivity, which was uh, rho is R A over L. So this is the length of the sample and the cross-sectional area. As we just said, although these two may change a small amount due to thermal expansion or contraction, they're essentially uh, going to be constant. Those small changes are going to be quite negligible. And so we can say that the resistivity is just going to be directly proportional to the resistance. So as the resistance goes up, in this case, so does the resistivity. So in metallic materials, what we see is an increase in temperature gives us an increase in the resistivity. What we see in uh, semiconductors and insulators is something quite different. So um, we'll, I'll write up the equation for drift velocity we had again, so I equals NAVE, and this time it's this quantity that's going to change. So we said, uh, you may recall we said that N is the uh, number density of charge carriers, and so what we get, if I sketch out another quick lattice, we can now imagine this is the lattice of a semiconductor, so something like silicon or germanium. And in this semiconductor, we have not very many free electrons around in order to conduct the electricity. Hence, uh, we have that much lower conductivity, a much higher resistivity, um, so a much higher resistance to the flow of current. Um, but each of these atoms uh, has lots of electrons whizzing around them. And because they're bound rather than free, these can't contribute towards the flow of electricity. But what happens as the temperature increases is the, some of these electrons start to uh, no longer become associated with their parent atom and start to become free. So this electron here is no longer bound and becomes a free electron. And as we increase the temperature a bit more, maybe this atom uh, will lose an electron into the general uh, body of the material, and that is free to flow. Maybe this one will lose one as well. And so you can see, as we increase the temperature in this semiconductor, we're increasing the number of free electrons in the sample that are able to move. And so as we do so, we increase the number density of the electrons. And this allows a greater current to flow for given values of all of the other quantities. And recalling that resistance is voltage over current, so resistance is inversely proportional to the current. If the current has gone up, that means that the resistance has gone down. So in a semiconductor, we see the opposite effect. We see rather than an increase in resistance decreasing the uh, uh, rather than an in increase in resistance increasing the resistivity or the resistance, we see an increase in temperature reduces it because we get these free electrons. Now both of these effects are present in semiconductors and in metals. So here in the semiconductor, these will also start vibrating more often. But the increase in the number density of charge carriers is much greater and dominates. In a metal, we do have one or two extra electrons coming available into the material, um, but uh, only a very, very small amount. And so in a metal, it's the increase in the vibrations reducing the drift velocity that is the, uh, by far the dominant effect. Uh, to get some idea of scale, uh, what we see in uh, a metal and a semiconductor such as germanium. Now, if we take uh, a sample of a metal, such as copper, silver, iron, something like that, and this sample of a semiconductor, if we increase the temperature by 10 degrees C, uh, then what we get is the metal, the resistance tends to increase by about 5%. In a semiconductor, it will halve. So you can see in the metal, this change uh, so, so this, if we have a 10 degree change from around room temperature, we'll increase the resistance by a noticeable but relatively small amount. Whereas in a semiconductor, these free electrons start to be come out of the material quite rapidly, and that small 10 degree change from room temperature uh, up to, say, 30 degrees is going to halve the resistance of some given sample of this semiconductor.
And now we can have a look at starting to try and model how the metal's resistance varies with temperature. So rather than having an equation which we can put in the temperature and some uh, properties of a metal uh, in order to get out the final resistance, what we're going to do is generate a model. So in our model we're going to say that over four relatively small temperature changes, so if we were going from 0 to 10 or 0 to 20 degrees, so over um, relatively small temperature changes, we say the resistance is proportional to the temperature. So if we double the temperature, we would double the resistance. If we halve the temperature, we would halve the resistance. But it's worth noting that this temperature, this needs to be in Kelvin, not in Celsius. So if we went from 10 degrees Celsius to 20 degrees Celsius, that would not be a doubling in temperature. So uh, in order to go from Celsius to Kelvin, we add 273. So if we were going from 10 Celsius to 20 Celsius, that would actually be uh, 283 to 293, so not a doubling. Uh, so we say resistance is proportional to temperature where that temperature is in Kelvin rather than Celsius. And if we've got uh, this proportionality, then we can imagine if we had uh, some resistance, that is going to be equal to some constant times temperature. So this k is just some dummy variable that I've stuck in to mean some constant. And it turns out that with what we're going to do, we don't actually need to know the value of this constant. Um, so we can work out if the temperature increases to some other quantity, how can we find the resistance? Well, what we can do is if we say we're starting off at temp uh, resistance R1 at some temperature T1 uh, and then increase to some temperature T2, what is this new resistance? We can rearrange both of these for K, so R1 over T1 is equal to K and R2 over T2 is equal to K, and so that means that we can have R1 over T1 is equal to K which is equal to R2 over T2. Or to, uh, or if we now drop that K, we can just say R1 over T1 is equal to R2 over T2. So by starting from this simple proportionality, we get to this equation here. So we don't actually have to know what K is if we know any three of these quantities. And so that's what we're going to have a quick look at in this worked example. So a sample of insulated nickel wire has resistance of 15 ohms at room temperature. Uh, room temperature is about 20 degrees C, which is going to be 293 Kelvin. It's submerged in a pot of boiling water, which is 100 Celsius, and therefore 373 Kelvin. Estimate the resistance of the wire while it is in the water. Uh, so what we had on our last slide, R1 over T1 equals R2 over T2 because R is proportional to T. So what we're doing here, we can generalize to other things. Any time we've got two quantities and we know that they're proportional to each other, uh, so a little later in the course, uh, at, uh, second year of the OCR course, you have a look at the uh, ideal gas where we find, for example, that the volume of some gas uh, is proportional to its temperature, then we could similarly do V1 over T1 is equal to V2 over T2. Uh, but in the meantime, let's stick with this. So uh, if we therefore want to find the final resistance R2, we get R2 is equal to R1 T2 over T1 when we arrange this. And so this is going to be 15 ohms times the 373 Kelvin over the 293 Kelvin. And when we punch that into a calculator, we find out that the value we get from that is 19.1 ohms. So this wire, in going from room temperature to the temperature of boiling water, goes from uh, 15 ohms up to just over 19 ohms. So this is the way that we can very simply uh, model the way in which resistance, or equivalently uh, in our case resistivity, will change with temperature over small ranges. And it turns out this can actually be quite an accurate way of doing it.